Let us pray. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. O Lord, our God, your Son, Jesus Christ, who is coming into the world, who rules over the world, spoke to his disciples saying, my father is working, therefore I am working too. Lord, open our hearts to your love this day that we may labor diligently in your name. Lord, we pray for our church family scattered across the city, across the nation, even across the world. Lord, we pour out our hearts in praise to you and ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this day. Prepare us for that which we would receive through James and Jessica, even as you are preparing their hearts to pour out for us your word and your truth and your witness, which is to the ends of the earth. Oh God, I pray for my sister in her ministry in Costa Rica. I pray that you would increase her faith Increase the faith of the women and men entrusted to her care. Lord, protect them. I pray that you would use this prayer as a shield and a buckler, that it might rest as a mantle upon their shoulders and grant them comfort while their friend and sister is far away. Lord, I pray that even as you are in all places and at all times, that you would prepare her as she prepares to return to Costa Rica. Lord, bless her and keep her and let the light of your countenance shine upon her that she might be saved, not for her own sake, but for the sake of those for whom you have called her. Lord Jesus, we love you so much, and we remember, even as we are scattered in our several homes, the persecuted church which gathers in secret. And Lord, even though they may feel in darkness, we feel the power of their light and witness and pray that you would unite your church, even as you and the Father are one. Lord, we pray for strength and boldness of witness and protection for those who fear for their very lives. Oh God, we pause this morning and we ask in the midst of the hustle and the bustle and even the tumult that has been this year, we pray that you would come and dwell richly in us this Christmas. Lord, it seems only a moment ago that we were beginning to light the Advent candles in preparation for your return and in preparation for remembering your first coming into the world. And so, Lord, I pray that each and every man and woman and child watching this service, participating in this service in spirit and in truth, would create a quiet place within their heart where they might know you as Lord and God, as Savior and as friend, as a dear brother. Lord, pour out your love upon us this day that we might share it with all those whom we meet in the way and proclaim to all those to whom you call us that the light has indeed overcome the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Zach. Good morning. I have had the privilege of praying with Zach Davis, not only just one-on-one, -on -one, but in a, in a room full of people. And I have this vision, and I, I'm, I'm going to embarrass him because he's a humble guy. And I have this vision of when Zach prays, God's head just kind of turns toward him <laughs> and listens to him. Uh, that's so beautiful. Thank you, Zach for your ministry, and it is a blessing to be together on this Sunday before Christmas. I cannot believe that we are here. It does seem like in an instant we were lighting the first candle, uh, and, and now here we are at right at Christmas. And uh, the Stecklers, it was so good to see them lighting that, that final candle today, or really that fourth candle. And and what a blessing it is to be the people of God and know that in times like these, God is at work. God is at work. And I'm so blessed to be a part of this, this congregation at this time. And I want to say we miss you. We miss being in this building together. And I believe in my heart that January is going to look a little different. 
but right now we're doing some some good things in spite of having to be out of the building. I believe we're doing the right thing, the safe thing right now. Let's keep praying um, for for the not only those that are producing this vaccine, but those who are taking this vaccine early on. It's such a risk, uh, but people are doing that, and I'm praying safety for them and blessings upon them as God just unfolds this plan of healing, I think, across our land. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to know God is still at work, even as we struggle through this pandemic. Well, we've been talking over the past few weeks about the light, and we've been in the first chapter of John, and I don't know about you, but I have been blessed over and over again by being in that first chapter. I think I told you early on as we talked through some things that when someone comes to Christ for the first time, I always recommend that they actually read the Gospel of John because it is the story of our faith. It, in a nutshell, I guess I would say, presents the story of our faith. And that is we are to be lights in the darkness, and that light is Christ. That light is Christ. And uh, this morning, you're going to hear from someone who I believe is a light or bringing that light into the darkness. And I'm going to read our, our scripture lesson first this morning. And I want you to listen closely. These are just a few verses from that first chapter. It begins at when chapter 1 at verse 9, and I'm going to read through verse 13, where it says, The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. Jessica Carter is one of our international staff members here at Centenary. And she was grown right here at Centenary. We have a lot of international staff members, as you know, but what makes her so very special to us is she grew up right here. She's a product of this ministry. Her dear family is uh, such an integral part of the ministry of Centenary, and we love them so much. And I have been just awestruck by this family's faith ever since the day I met them, especially because of the faith they put in Jesus as their daughter does ministry in some amazing ways in Costa Rica. She's there in San Jose working at Christ for the City, and uh, she is not always in the safest places when she does her ministry. And I pray for her daily. I think about Jessica so often. And when I found out she was going to be in town, we began to think about how we could have her really relate her story here today. So many of you know Jessica's story, but many of you may not, those of you who join us online regularly and are somewhat new to our ministry. But I'm telling you, if you are looking for a Christmas blessing, today you're going to get one as you listen to this dear woman as she tells you what God is doing in the midst of her ministry in Costa Rica. She's a part of Refuge Church there, and they, they have a, a ministry there where they, uh, it actually means you shine brighter in darkness, and she'll probably tell you a little bit about that. Pastor Christian is there, and I'm sure she'll mention all of that to you. But Jessica is doing ministry in a way that, that many would not. They, they just would not do it because of the safety issues that are involved. But God blesses her. He's surrounded her with uh, wonderful people. And she has uh, dear and deep friendships in this place. And she's making 
marks for the kingdom that I don't really believe she'll ever, ever know about until she gets to heaven. And so I'm just blessed to be in ministry with her. So if you would welcome this morning Jessica Carter to Centenary. So good morning. Um, it's exciting to be here. As uh, Pastor James was sharing, this is my home church. Um, I don't know any other churches other than the church that I participate in Costa Rica. Um, grew up here. Um, since I was little, I remember walking in the doors. I've watched the changes here. Um, and I just, as he said, I'm a product of this place. And it's the truth. I, I grew up and you guys poured into me the love of Christ, the light of Christ, and Centenary had such a passion for missions, and so I began to go on mission trips in high school and fell in love with Costa Rica and continued through college here at the University of Kentucky and part of the ministry here. Um, I helped with the youth. Um, but what I want to get at is that you guys have believed in me. Um, you guys have invested in me and you've empowered me, and so what I am today and what I do today has everything to do with what Centenary is doing here. So um, please don't think light of bringing your children here. Don't think light of your kids going to youth group here. Don't think light of um, the people that are investing in your families because it's changed my life 100%. And who I am today is not possible without that. So um, I just want to begin with that because this is like me coming home. It is me coming home. Um, I'm sad that you guys can't be here with me today, but... Um, it's such an honor that they've given me this opportunity to share. And so I have three points that I want to share. And along with that, I'm going to share part of my story. And so I hope you'll follow along. So the first point that the verses that Pastor James just read talks about Jesus being the true light. Um, as a child growing up here, we constantly were being told Jesus is the light, that the light of the world is, is in him and we have that in us. Um, and they taught us that song of this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine and don't let Satan blow it out. It's such a simple song, but it has such profound truths to who we are. Um, since I can remember that those words of Jesus' light has been spoken over me. Um, but I want to tell you for a long time, I could tell you Jesus is the light, but those words weren't conviction in my heart. But today, um, that's the heartbeat of what I do is Jesus is the only light, the true light, and he's the only answer to the problems in our world today. Um, so I want to share with you about three years ago, um, part of, I now have a house that's housing girls that are coming out of addictions, um, gangs, suicide, and so um, this is the beginning of that. So where they're going to put on the screen a girl, and you're going to see her. This is Candy. Um, she was 21 at the time, and this is after the story I'm going to share. So um, I met Candy. I went to see her sister, Anna, who I'd been discipling. And Anna said, don't, I don't need help today. Go see my sister. And so I walked into their little shack with holes on the floor um, down by this river. And as I was there, um, she begins to just cry and share, there's a gang after her. She has drug debt. They're going to kill her. Um, she's broken. She said, I don't know what to do with myself. I have three years of consuming crack, and I have no hope. And then she shared, and last night out back, I tried to hang myself on, on the coconut tree behind my house. And she's in tears, and, and I'm sitting there as I'm listening to this, and, and my heart said, well, what can I offer her? What can I do? Um, how can I change this? What could I ever do? And I don't know if you're like me, and maybe you haven't been in that situation, but there's moments where somebody shares something with you, and our response is, what could we do? How could we fix it? Um, but I want to mention here, I am a missionary, and my job is to share Jesus. And beyond that, I grew up in church, but my reaction still was, what can I do for this girl? Um, but in that moment, I think, is when I fully understood that the only thing I could do was to present Jesus. The only thing she could, that she needed was Jesus. And so as I'm standing there, I just shared Jesus probably in the purest form I've ever presented him, because I think so often... I tried to sugarcoat him. I tried to make my friends not think. Um, I didn't want to embarrass myself, if that's the truth. Um, and I think as I shared with her, I just shared the only thing I can offer you today is Jesus. And in that tiny little house, 
she received Jesus, and that's where it all changed. Um, she understood that Jesus was the light, and she's in. Her problems didn't change, but what changed was the hope and joy inside of her heart. And so from that moment on, I realized I couldn't be like that song that says, um, where is that? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But so often we allow Satan to blow it out or we hide it under a bushel. And so in that moment, I realized the only thing I had to offer her was Jesus, and that's what I did. And in that little shack, she received Jesus. And today, that's a conviction for my heart, is Jesus is the only person, the only thing that I can offer that's going to transform someone's life. And so I want you guys to understand that we have to shine for Jesus. And let that be a conviction that rings true for this church, that we are shining, that we are shining for Jesus. And so um, that first verse talks about that, that Jesus is the true light. Um, the second point I want to get into, it says that everyone who believes will be a child of God. That's everyone. And I think so often we want to we wanna just declare, well, it's for those people or these people, but it's for everyone. And so we say that all the time. I've heard it since I was little that it's for everyone, but it's so simple. Those who believe will be declared child of God. And so often we think, well, you've got to get rid of this. You've got to get rid of that. You have to be this. You have to be that. But what happens is when you believe in Jesus, your life is transformed. And I've seen it over and over and over as lives of people that I would have never preached to are being transformed by the power of Jesus. And so um, normally, not this year because of COVID and the pandemic, we have about three camps a year called extreme camps. And so um, the first time, what we do is we bring gang members, hitmen, addicts, um, people from the street, so they can have an encounter with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And the first time that they invited me to extreme camp, I was all excited thinking about these extreme sports, that we were going to go rock climbing, we were going to, you know, fly off a bungee jump or, you know, these extreme things. Um, but I didn't understand there was no extreme sports. What there was, an extreme dose of the Holy Spirit, an extreme dose of God. And it was all day of just pouring into these guys and women who needed to know the love of Jesus and then being broken before the Lord and realizing Jesus is the only answer. Um, so we're going to put another picture on the screen of some of my friends. Um, this is from a camp about two years ago. Um, the guy on my right is named Christopher, and after choosing to follow Jesus this past year, he was killed for following, for he leaving the drugs. Moti, who's the one right on my left with the red cap, um, he's still fighting to follow Jesus. It's still a process. Um, his brother is the second largest drug dealer in all of Costa Rica, and so he's in a fight to choose to follow Jesus. But God is, is changing him. And then I want to flip to Raymond, who's the one on the far left in the blue. Um, and so Raymond, he came to camp. This was two years ago. And he decided to follow Jesus. He was a hitman. He'd done a lot of bad things. He'd um, had a lot of blood on his hands. But it was really interesting because in that moment at camp, he found Jesus. He found the forgiveness of the Lord and it was about 20 days after camp, he came to Pastor Christian. He said, I know I'm going to die, and I know I deserve it because I've done a lot of bad things. But in the middle of that, I have hope because I know I'm going home to Jesus. And so when we go back to that, all that believe are declared children of God. Many people would say, Raymond doesn't deserve the grace of God, the mercy of God. I used to think that when I saw people, I'd say, well, why would I preach to that person? They'll never change. And I don't know if you're like me, but there's a lot of people that I don't preach to because I think I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to embarrass myself, number one. Or number two, they're never going to change. But I, I want to reiterate that it says everyone who believes. So everyone and anybody is being welcomed into the family of God if they choose to follow Jesus. And, and the rest of it's up to God to deal with. Um, and so as a ministry, we work a lot with gang members, hitmen, addicts. It's a, messy, it's a messy ministry. But we've watched as God is transforming their lives. And so we have the center as uh, Pastor James shared, the refuge. And so right now it hosts 30 guys who are leaving that life behind. They're leaving the darkness and they've come into the light. And 
just because COVID's hit, all of Costa Rica, Christ for the Cities Ministries have pretty much shut down. Um, and we took the challenge of faith to continue because that's 30 lives. Um, I currently have three girls in my house, um, and I'm going to get to that towards the end. And so that's 33 lives that we decided to continue investing in and continuing to believe God that he was going to supply. Um, and so we haven't stopped working. And we are part of God's kingdom just as much as you're part of God's kingdom. And so our heart and our cry is that Jesus' church will advance. And as a ministry, our vision is that in this time, God is raising up people without names. Um, I'm going to read a verse in 1 Corinthians 1.28 from the Passion Version. It says, He chose the lowly and the laughable in the world's eyes, nobodies, so that he would shame the somebodies. For he chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent. And, and that's kind of the heart of our ministry is we believe in this time that God is raising up people without faces, people that are nobodies, people that are trapped in sin, that are trapped in a life of darkness, but God's bringing the light. And we want to be a part of that. And that's the future of the church. And that's the future of the church here because there's a lot of people um, that are sitting in your offices, that are sitting in your own houses. There's people in the grocery store. There's people who even come physically to church here who need the love of Jesus. But as the church, we have to begin to respond in that way. And I want to tell you something. It's not just um, that last verse talks about being reborn. And so when you follow Jesus, you're reborn and his spirit comes in you. But that comes with a whole, a whole process of surrendering to God. And so um, it says that as we live for Jesus in 1 John 2, 8, that the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And so as that light begins to shine, but it says... That happens when we begin to love. And so love has to be the center of who we are. And so I want to share another, another friend of mine. His name's Olhid because um, I think it's going to show up on the screen again. So on the right, you can see him. This was about a year ago, and this is Olhid today um, before he came to the refuge. And so it's a process. I know it's, it's hard to preach to somebody who's a mess, but that's God's job to go through. And so about a month ago, um, we were preaching on forgiveness because it's a whole process of healing. And I think um, the United States, we need to enter into a time of forgiveness and a time of love and a time of, of stop judging everybody else and begin to love them where they're at. And, and all here is an example for myself, is an example for you. Um, he's 28, but he's learning to live for Jesus. Um, but that means he has to heal his heart. If he wants to continue loving people, he has to be healed first. And we preached about forgiveness and invited the guys to enter into that, to, to truly forgive. And so um, in tears, he came up to Pastor Christian after the sermon and said, I've decided to forgive my father, which for the majority of the guys and women in the refuge, they have um, hurts from their fathers, from their mothers, but in this case, he said, when I was eight years old, I watched as my father killed my mother in front of me. That's a hard thing to forgive. Um, that's not an easy thing to forgive. But he realized, if Jesus has forgiven me, it's my job to forgive. Jesus calls us that if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. And so um, beyond that, he said, I've decided today to forgive my father. And beyond that, he's getting out of jail this week, and I'm going to go to him and tell him that. And he went about two weeks ago, and he shared with his father the love of Jesus and said, I've forgiven you. Um, and he said it went super, su it was super cool. But to me, I'm still amazed because that's a big thing to forgive. And so often, little things we're not willing to forgive. I'm not willing to forgive. Somebody's done something to me, and I, I want to hold that grudge. But that's where God wants to heal our heart. He wants that light to shine in us so that darkness will disappear and the true light will shine. And so I want to move into my, my third point, and we're going to go back to those two middle verses. Um, and it, it says, the world didn't recognize him. And even worse, in uh, the New Living Translation, it said they rejected him. And to me, as I'm reading that, I'm like, that's pretty strong. That's the, that Jesus came, and they didn't recognize him. And then they even rejected him. And, I, and as I, I read that, I said, well, that wouldn't be me. I would know that's Jesus. But um, God really convicted my heart as I was um, studying for this, and God changed my perspective because so often I've rejected God. 
I haven't recognized God. God's moving in our midst. He's alive. We serve a alive and living God, but so often we miss it. Um, so often, as I was sharing before, I would never preach to a prostitute. Before, I would never preach to a hitman. But I've seen various hitmen who have come to know Jesus. I have one friend, his name's David, and he's a mechanic, but he used to be a hitman. And he shared with me, he's gone to every single person that he, family that he's taken a life and asked them to forgive him. I mean, that's powerful to say, I know I did wrong, but I want to ask you to forgive me um, because Jesus is forgiving me and I want the light of Jesus to shine. But that's somebody that I would have never before in my life preached to because I would have said there's no hope. But there's hope because Jesus is alive. He is the light. He is moving. And so in my own life, and I, I believe for Centenary, we don't want to be a part of not recognizing God or rejecting him because Jesus is calling people He's calling every one of us to be a part of it. That's our call, is to go and make disciples. It's not to go judge. It's not to go condemn. It's to go shine the light of Christ to the world. Um, and, and remembering it's for everyone. And Centenary's done such a good job of that because I'm a product of that. I, I've learned from what Centenary has taught me. And so as a church, we need to be about that. Um, and we've got to stop looking at other people's sin, their messed up lives, their color of skin, and let's start loving people as Jesus did. But to do that, you have to be willing to step back and say, where is God moving and what is Jesus doing? And so I'm going to finish with two stories that are um, pretty cool of talking about that. And so um, one of them is right before COVID hit, we began a ministry of making bread. One of the guys in the refuge came. Um, it's pretty cool because they all have these talents that are amazing. And so one of the guys knew how to make bread. And so he began to teach the other guys in the refuge. And so we started this bread ministry. And we got a phone call um, about a month into the pandemic that the veggies we used to pick up, we, we go and we collect these veggies from this market, and then we give them out to families. And so um, the veggies were basically rotting away because no one was coming to get them. And so we went to get them. And we picked them up, and we took them, and we had a line out to the main road, five, six blocks of people desperate for a bag of veggies. Um, but we've, we've realized, and we're teaching these guys and these women that they're to be the light of Christ, to not just say it's for us, because technically the veggies are donated to the refuge, but we've decided to give it to the community, um, to be a blessing, to be about being a blessing. And so um, in the middle of that, about two weeks into it, we're, we're set up, we're social distancing, and the health department shows up and says that we're having church, which we were not having church. Um, but the woman told Pastor Christian, she said, well, I'm on a mission, and my mission is to shut down the church. It's kind of similar to stuff that's happening here, where um, churches are being shut down, you're not allowed to meet, there's restrictions, and we have to respect that. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but in that moment... They shut us down. They put a fine on us for um, $1,000, and they shut us down and condemned our building. And so in the midst of that, what normally happens is we complain, we're angry, we're frustrated, we just want to give up. And we were in that place. But God spoke, and I think that's the point I want to get at, is God is speaking to all of us. In the middle of our hardship, in the middle of our problems, God is speaking, and he wants to do something through you and with you. And so in that moment, he told us, build a second floor. Um, and not just build a second floor, but build this floor to have this bakery that's going to be an institute to teach all of these women and men who are coming to get the veggies. Let's not just give them food, but let's give them the tools to be able to sustain their family, to reactivate the economy for these families that have nothing. And so we began to build um, in faith because there wasn't much money, but we began to lay the foundation of the second floor in the church, and uh, it was kind of funny because we had our Christ for the City devotional, and we're in the middle of the devotional, and Pastor Christian showing our boss, Gretel, um, the, the, the progress, and she's amazed, but she's like, Pastor Christian, you can't be building. The building's condemned. You're not allowed inside the building. And so in that moment, we made the decision, stop all construction, stop everything. And the guys were saying, well, don't worry, it's just welding. No one's going to hear us. Um, but we decided to, to abide by what was being said. And so within 15 minutes, the health department's back on our door 
asking for Pastor Christian's signature. And to come to find out, the, the Minister of Health of Costa Rica found out what had happened and that it was unjust and it was unright that they had shut us down. And he lifted the fine and lifted the, um, he lifted the fine in the closing, which was a huge victory for God. But in that, we've moved forward. We advanced. We saw what God was doing. And now um, in January, we're going to open this bakery that's going to teach all these women how to, how to make bread and how to sustain their families. And so we're, our hope is to open a daycare as well. And so their kids can be in the daycare. And then when they finish making the bread, they can go and sell it. And so it's just really cool when you realize what God's doing and you recognize that and you move into that. Um, the other story I want to share has to do with my house. So about after I met Candy, who you saw in the beginning, um, she, that kind of sparked a passion in my heart because we had a ministry for men, but there was nothing for women. And so we, we sought out a place for her, and we finally found a place, but there are very few centers for women in Costa Rica. And so God really put it on my heart, and I began praying for a center for women. And come to find out, God wasn't asking for a center. He was asking for me and my house to be the center. Um, and so I took that step of faith. And so about two years ago, I built my house, and now it's been up and running for about a year and a half, I believe. And so currently, I think they're going to throw a photo up there, maybe, of my house. So this is my house. It's a container. Um, Pastor James last year said I lived in a trailer park, but it's like, kind of like that. And then to the next photo, these are some of the girls that I'm about to tell a story about, and then the next one. And then these are the two girls. So Vanessa's on the right, and then Fabi's on the left, and then... The little girl in the middle is named Sochi. She's five years old. So they are the ones currently living in my house. Um, and this all happened because I recognized what God was doing, and he asked me to be a part of it, and I took a step. Um, but I want to share about a week and a half ago, we've been doing the, we have four services in Costa Rica, and the fourth one is for, um, we split the girls and the guys up. And so the girls were all together, and the Lord really pressed on my heart. He said, invite all these girls over to your house. For Friday night. And Friday nights in my house are pizza nights. And so my first reaction to the Lord was, well, that's a lot of pizza. Um, it's like 15 girls. I normally have five. And so the Lord responded to me, said, do you not realize that I've got it under control? And so I said, all right. So I told all these girls, come over to my house Friday night because um, God's going to, we're going to have fun and God's going to move. And so I had about, I think there were like 13 of us that showed up. And they all stayed the night at my house, and we ate pizza, and, and God moved in power. Um, near my house, there's a, an outlook over the city, and you can see all the city lights. And so we talked about that, of Jesus is the light of the world, that Jesus is shining. And just as those little lights, just one of them wouldn't shine. But when they come together, when we're united as a church and we're not divided, it's powerful. It's, it's bright. And in the middle of that, this is the moment that, so I recognized God, and, and I obeyed what he asked. But in that, Vanessa comes to me. She said, I really feel like God wants us to pray one for another. Um, Vanessa's from El Salvador. She's been with me for eight months. She's a refugee. Um, she escaped from her boyfriend who um, is part of one of the gangs in El Salvador, and he had planned to kill her and her five-year-old daughter. And so she's been in my house for eight months, and God's doing crazy awesome things in her. But in this moment, she says, God, I, Jessica, I think we should all pray together. Why don't you bring everyone together? And I looked at her and I said, it's, it's your turn to do it. And, and I just watched as she brought all these girls. Some are like 13, some 15, some are 20. Um, this group of 15 girls, she brought us all together and just shared our heart of God's placed us together to love one another. We were placed together to, to carry one another's burdens. And she just began to say, I want to pray for you. So I want to know what's going on. I want you guys to be real. And I'm standing there listening to this, and I'm like, wow, God, this is cool. She's, she's growing. She's moving. She's advancing. And, and in that, it was just so cool because she recognized what God wanted to do in that moment. She realized what God was doing. And instead of rejecting him, which so often I've done, I hear God say something. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. That's kind of weird. That's kind of strange. Um, she moved in that. And so... Um, I just want to really encourage you guys that um, I want to go back to the beginning is will you shine your light for Jesus? Will you shine for him? 
And, and I heard a pastor say last week, he said, it's not so much will you die for him, because before is would you be willing to die for Jesus? But in this time of being closed up into your houses and, and life's a little different, wearing a mask and all these different things is, will you live for Jesus? Will you live for him and let him use you where you're at? The second one is, will you be a child of God? And a child of God means you've got to be a child of light. You've got to be a child who loves, a child who walks as the hands and feet of Jesus. And in effect, you're pushing the darkness back and the light's going to shine. We say in Costa Rica, our ministry, our, our motto is, in the darkness we shine even brighter. But if you're not in the darkness, you're not shining. And, and darkness is the absence of light. So when we walk into a room as Christ, because the light of Christ is in each one of you and in me, we are bringing light. The darkness has to flee. And then the last point I want to ask you is, will you join me in recognizing what God's doing? Will we stand up as a church and recognize how God's moving, and are we going to walk into it? It may be a little risky. It may be a little scary. It may be new, but... God has a mission for each one of you, and, and I want to, to reiterate, and I don't think I said this at the beginning, I'm no different than you. I grew up here. I, I went to children's church here. I went to the runway, if you are back in the day, runway, super runway. Then I was in Encounter. Um, then I was in the college ministry. I've done stuff with the mission, the global impact, the local impact. Um, I, I've done all of that here, and what I'm doing today it, it may sound like, wow, Jessica, that's pretty cool. God's, God's doing cool things. But the key, and the, the key that each one of us has is when God asks you to do something, say yes. Say yes. Take the risk. Take a step of faith and believe that the God who's gotten you here is going to do it again. And don't miss what God's doing. But you have to realize God's in control and his plans are higher than you've ever imagined for your life. But it's taking that step and saying, all right, I'm in. And there's a lot of people here at Centenary that are in. There's a lot of you that have said you're in, but it's every day taking one more step. And so um, it's not saying everybody needs to move to another country, but it's saying tomorrow when I'm in the grocery store and God presses something on my heart, am I going to speak up? Or if I'm with my kids, am I going to encourage them and lead them to follow Christ, to have godly habits? Um, and so it may be a risk and it may be new and it may be scary, but I want to invite you into that. And so that we would shine for Jesus. We'd be children of the light. And we would recognize what God's doing. So I want to ask you to, to pray with me to bow your heads as the worship team comes back up. God, I just, I want to give you thanks in this morning. God, I want to just honor you for what you're doing at Centenary, for the way you're moving, for the way that the light of Christ is shining in this place. God, I pray that you would fan that flame. God, that our hearts would be on fire for you, that we would shine like never before, God, that we wouldn't be embarrassed of what other people would think, but we would be concerned what you're going to think, Lord, that you would use us in powerful ways, that we would realize we are children of God, and as children of God, those promises are true over our life, that we can claim them in faith and know that you will always be with us, that you promise that one and another time, God, that you are with us and that we should not live in fear. Do not fear is written 365 times in your word, Lord. And so I just declare in this, this morning, God, that we would be children of light, that we would be a family of light. We would be centenary, the place of light, a place that's shining in the middle of the darkness, God. And then I just ask that you would open our ears, Lord, to hear your word, to hear what you're saying, and that our hearts would just burn for you, God, and that we would recognize what you're doing and we would move in that, that we'd walk in faith. So God, I just, I give you thanks for every person that's listening. And I pray that this word would be a seed that, that would flourish, God, that it would grow. And so I just ask, God, as we move into Christmas this next week, God, that we would remember that the true reason for the season is the light of Christ. So God, we just give you thanks and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.